John McManus. Most of you probably have heard him before. He's been with us now. Uh, this is the third time he's becoming a regular. And, of course, we don't get tired of him. But let me just uh, give a little bit of his bio here. John F. McManus was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1935. <laughs> At graduation from Holy Cross College in Massachusetts, he received a bachelor's degree in physics and a commission in the United States Marine Corps. After serving three years of active duty, he entered the field of electronics engineering where he was won an award from the U.S. Air Force for, having, for designing a component used in fighter aircraft. Jack left the engineering field in 1966 to accept a full-time position with the John Birch Society. Working closely with its founder, Robert Welch, for many years, he was uh, named the Society's Public Relations Director and its official spokesman. In 1991, he was appointed as president. He's the author of several books and numerous articles. He's represented the Society in hundreds of media appearances, He's spoken from uh, JBS platforms in all 50 states, and uh, written and produced several JBS films and videos. With his wife, Mary, Jack now resides in Waterfield, Massachusetts. Wakefield, Wakefield. This print's awfully slow, awfully small, and my eyes are getting worse all the time. Anyway, let's give a great welcome to the John McManus. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen for having me back, it's quite an honor. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, start off by putting to rest a rumor that's been floating around in the country. <clears throat> we all know that they claim to have killed Osama bin Laden. And uh, of course, we never saw the body and they supposedly dumped him in the ocean. And uh, there are some people who really wonder whether or not he's dead. Well, we just received absolute confirmation he's dead. No doubt about it anymore. His name's on the voting list in Chicago. <laughs> I got a call the other day from a fellow who said he was gonna run for Congress, and he said, I know that if I do, they're gonna ask me what I wanna do when I get to Congress. In fact, he'd already had a little press conference and somebody did ask him exactly that. And he said, I thought I gave a pretty good answer, but he said, if you were asked that question and you were in my shoes, how would you answer the question? I said, that's pretty easy. I said, I'd say, I'm not going down to Washington to do anything. I'm going down there to undo all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to remember one of my favorite lines before I get into discussing here. I'm gonna be talking about neoconservatives. And my line is simple. And maybe all of you can remember this. America is great not because of what government did, but because of what government was prevented from doing. <laughs> right, right? And it was prevented from doing by the Constitution of the United States which still stands and therefore we can get back to it, right? Now you may have heard that we exhibited the last couple of years at CPAC in Washington and we were disinvited. We were told not to come back, right? Well, it was shortly after the 2011 CPAC that we had a feature article, in fact the cover of our New American Magazine featured uh, the fellow that they gave the award to for the Constitution Bearer of the Year, the, the great ex, uh, exponent of the Constitution, they gave it to Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> so when we got kicked out, we said, well, you know, we should have jumped ahead of him, we should have quit, <laughs> right? Okay, well, we're gonna move ahead now. I got a PowerPoint presentation that you can take a look at, and I'm gonna go through it fairly quickly here at the beginning. We define Americanism, of course, that our rights came from a creator, not from government or any place else, and that government's purpose is simply to safeguard those rights. And we have limited government under the U.S. Constitution, and commerce with all entanglements with none, right? 
wouldn't it be nice if we get back to all of that? In the 1930s, there was a president named Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In fact, he lasted into the 40s as well. And he authored the Socialistic New Deal, massive creation of government departments, bureaus, and agencies, trashed the Constitution, deepened the 1930s depression, and steered our country into war. That is actually the neoconservative agenda right there, before they, they coined the term neoconservative, as we'll see. Now, growing up in the John Birch Society, I remember we always used to refer to ourselves as conservatives. Uh, I point to Robert Welsh here, the man who founded the Birch Society. When the New Deal got started, Roosevelt took office in 1933, even in 1934, Robert Welsh wrote an essay called A Weight on My Shoulders. And he said, my America is being made over into a carbon copy of thousands of despotisms that have gone before. So he eventually started the John Birch Society to try and reverse that trend, right? Now, the, the people who were conservatives back in the 60s and the 50s, of course, were looking to Russell Kirk, the father of modern conservatism. He wrote this book called Conservative Mind. And, 1942, and I would bet there'd be some people here who have read that. And then, of course, we had Barry Goldwater's book that was uh, actually ghosted for him by Brent Bozell. Mr. Conservative, he was known as. The Conscience of a Conservative, and that book got a lot of people involved in, in things that they hadn't been involved in before, including the Birch Society. Then, of course, we had the great Robert Taft from Ohio, known and widely respected as Mr. Republican, he was the non-interventionist leader of the 1940s and 50s, right? And he's the precise opposite of a neoconservative, right? So what's a neoconservative? A neoconservative is somebody that's implementing what Carol Quigley said in his famous book, Tragedy and Hope, 1,350 pages. I think this is on page 1247, right? I'm glad somebody read through it all. I couldn't handle it all. But toward the end of his book, he said, the two parties should remain almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, more than anybody in America, you know that's what has happened. That's why there's a Constitution party. I see people say we need a third party, and I, no, 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 we need a second party. Right? <laughs> Well, how about the neoconservatives? The godfather of the neoconservative movement was Irving Kristol, and he delighted in being called the godfather of the movement. And he defined what it is in a short passage in his book, his 1995 book. He said, we accepted the New Deal in principle and had little affection for the kind of isolationism that then permeated American conservatism. All right, so you've got it there. Socialism in the New Deal and interventionism in foreign affairs. That's the, new, that's the neoconservatives. And these are the people that have taken control of the upper echelon, echelons of the uh, Republican Party, and there are some of them in the Democrat Party as well. So we see that the John Birch Society, we're not isolationists. I get asked that all the time on radio shows. You sound like an isolationist. I said, no, I'm not an isolationist. I'm a non-interventionist with your son, your daughter, and your wallet. <laughs> so we want non-intervention in the affairs and the wars of other nations, obviously. Now, Irving Kristol also at one point said, a conservative welfare state is perfectly consistent with the neoconservative perspective. Conservative welfare state? That a little like dry water, <laughs> bright darkness. <laughs> I, it, but, but these people have told us what they are, what they stand for. Again, neoconservatism then is socialism at home, interventionist foreign policy, including wars. They love wars, right? They love it. Now, let me make a point here that might surprise some people, and that is this, that I think Socialism is more deadly than communism. Now, the author of the both of them, Socialism and Communism, is the same. It's Karl Marx, right? But the route to the goal is different. 
Why do I say that socialism is more deadly? Well, communists seize power swiftly, and the resistance still exists. Hence, there's secret police, NKVD, KGB, so forth. You get over to the socialists, they seize power slowly by persuading voters to choose total government, and resistance is destroyed in the process. And you end up with a dependent population. Now, ladies and gentlemen, isn't that what's happening to America, right? We're not being made a communist country. We're being made a socialist country. And that's what they intend. So try to remember that, that socialism is more deadly because it destroys resistance. Well, how did the neoconservatives get started? You go back to 1972, according to Crystal. He said the nomination of George McGovern signified that the Democrat Party was not hospitable to any degree of neoconservatism. There were the hippies and the yippies and the, uh, the druggies and everybody else. And, and well, uh, Irving Crystal and his buddies didn't like that. Only a few of us drew the obvious conclusion that we would have to try to find a home in the Republican Party, but with every passing year, our numbers grew. And sure they did, right? So it was 1972 when they decided to stop being Democrats and they moved into the Republican Party, right? Uh, Neoconservative, we, we already got that. Now another feature of neoconservatism that can't be ignored is what Kristol himself said, I regard myself lucky to have been a young Trotskyite and I have not one single bitter memory. Well, with this kind of an audience, I don't have to explain to many people that, who Trotsky was and what he stood for, but let's just mention that he and Lenin seized control of Russia in 1917. And Lenin died in 1924, and then he partnered, did, did Trotsky, he partnered with Stalin. And <clears throat> John Ehrman, in the rise of neoconservatism, and of course he's a pro-neocon, this guy. The other important influence on neoconservatives was the leg of, legacy of Trotsky. They, they, they're bold about it. In the framework of international communism, the Trotskyites were rabid internationalists rather than realists or nationalists, right? So Trotskyism is at the core of neoconservatism, right? There's Leon Trotsky, partnered with Lenin, seized control of Russia in 1917. Lenin died in 24, partnered then with Stalin. But then they had the differences, Stalin and, and Trotsky, and Trotsky had to flee Russia for his life. He hung around Europe for a while, and he ended up in Mexico at the home of a communist named Diego Rivera. And he was murdered in Mexico in 1940 by one of Stalin's agents. The point about Trotsky, though, is that he never ceased working for total government. So if you say that you were a Trotskyite and you have not one bitter memory, you're indicting yourself. Seriously, right? Which is what these neoconservatives have done and continue to do. They loved Trotsky, right? Oh, they, they were anti-communist. They didn't like Stalin. Well, if you like Trotsky, you're no good. You're, a, you're another kind of communist. Who helped Irving Kristol take over? There's a bunch of names here. Richard Barnett, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. He's a Democrat, by the way, and, and they, they moved some of their forces into the Democrat area. Michael Novak, Elliot Abrams, Ben Wattenberg, Midge Dechter, Richard Pearl, Michael Ledeen, Norman Podoritz, and two names that I've underlined, William F. Buckley Jr. and Robert Bartley. William F. Buckley Jr., people say? I said, yeah, yeah, William F. Buckley Jr. Let's get into that, all right? There's the cover of the book that I've written on William Buckley. I went back and I researched this man and I found out that in 1952 he was in the CIA stationed in Mexico and he said he was in deep cover. Then he never said what the deep cover was, we never found out, but he did admit to being in deep cover with the CIA and that to me is an indictment in itself. Right? But he wrote an article for Commonweal Magazine, that's a Catholic publication, and it appeared in January of 1952. Now this is the man who's been touted by so many as the leader of the conservative movement and how sad it is that he's no longer around because he was such a great leader of the conservative movement. But in 1952 he said, we have got to accept big government for the duration. 
the instrument of a totalitarian bureaucracy within our shores, and the attendant centralization of power in Washington. Does that sound like conservatism to you? William Buckley actually said that? I've been challenged on that, and when I've been challenged, I simply showed the magazine. I said, here's, what, here's the magazine, read it for yourself, right? So that's, that's part of what's in my book, but there's a lot more. Indefensible stands taken by William Buckley, all fitting into the neocon perspective. In the foreign policy arena, United Nations, pro-NAFTA, pro-World Trade Organization, pro-UN peacekeeping, pro-Export-Import Bank, pro-bailout of Mexico. Whenever the, the liberals and the internationalists needed somebody to back something to, to silence some of the opposition in Congress and some of the American people, they went to William Buckley. If you back this thing, then we can get it through. He did, over and over and over again. Domestic policy, William Buckley in favor of gun control, the Kyoto Protocol, abortion, prostitution, federal education, wage and price controls. I've only just touched on it. It's all in the book, right? And it can't be denied. I think one of the reasons we got kicked out of CPAC is that in 2011, we had the book up for sale on the, on the book table there in, in our booth, and one of the real big conservative leaders came by, looked down at it, sneered at it, picked it up, was holding it, and I was standing there, and I said, well, have you read the book? No, and I don't intend to. I said, well, why not? I said, it's all true, and nothing's ever been found in it. He said, you shouldn't have that here. I said, but it's truth. Why shouldn't we have it here if it's truth? I said, we, you shouldn't have it here, and he put the book down and walked away. Right? I'll not say who it is, but uh, some of you would, would know the name. I know Howard would know the name. Right? I'll tell you later. <laughs> so William Buckley, all kinds of betrayals all along the way. And as far as the John Birch Society is concerned, he's probably the greatest enemy we ever had. He kept millions of Americans from taking a look at what the John Birch Society had to offer. Right? It, it wasn't a communist so-called, it wasn't somebody who was an obvious leftist or anything that did all that, no. No, he kept the good people away from us. He started his magazine in 1955, and the initial staff at National Review included his buddies Trotskyites. Trotskyite OSS CIA veteran James Burnham. Trotsky at OSS CIA veteran Wilmore Kendall. He's the one who steered Buckley into the CIA. CIA veteran Priscilla Buckley, his, one of his sisters, and an ex-communist named Frank Meyer. Now, I can remember years ago, what happened here? <coughs> Help! <laughs> I can remember years ago, uh, Robert Welsh was on a radio show one time, or no, it was a, a small press conference. And uh, I don't know whether we're gonna come up with this or not. But anyhow, somebody uh, said to him, why should we listen to you about communism? Why don't we listen to somebody who's an ex-communist who knows all about it? And Robert Welsh's response was simply, why don't you listen to somebody who was never stupid enough to be a communist in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> There were two names I had underlined, William Buckley and William Bartley. William Bartley was the editor of the Wall Street Journal. And way back in the early 90s, he went to Irving Kristol and he said, I'd like you to start sending articles to us. We'll publish them in the Wall Street Journal. And so Kristol did write one, and this one was quite significant, I thought, so we, we saved it, uh, June 3 of 1991. And this is Kristol writing, and he said, the the conference, and it was held in May of 1991, was sponsored by William Buckley's National Review. So William Buckley and Kristall arranged for a conference of conservative leaders. Right? And most of those attending regarded themselves as conservatives first and Republicans second. By the end of the meeting, a significant reversal had recurred. Most were now Republicans first and conservatives second. Complete switch. And they said that President Bush is now the leader of the conservative movement within the Republican Party. They're talking about Daddy Bush there, right? The leader of the conservative movement within the Democrat Party, within the Republican Party. What's the difference? Huh? What's the difference? 
Well, who was Papa Bush? He popularized the phrase New World Order after years and years of us telling people that the slogan of a conspiracy to rule mankind was New World Order. He came out over and over again talking about New World Order. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge. I think that what's at stake here is the new world order, a reinvigorated United Nations. And that new world order is only going to be enhanced if this newly activated peacekeeping function of the UN proves to be effective. This was leading up to the first invasion of uh, Baghdad in 1991. Here's my late friend, Joe Sobran. He worked for 21 years alongside William Buckley before being unceremoniously dismissed. And he expressed great admiration and enthusiasm for my book, Pied Piper for the Establishment. He told me at one point, he said, I wish I'd known all this in, when I was still working there. Well, he would have gotten fired earlier if he had. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Sobran. John McManus has gathered together a mountain of damning but firmly documented data about William Buckley. American conservatism's longtime intellectual leader has been a calamity for conservatism. Yeah. Right. Well put. Joe Sobran was a wonderful guy. I don't know if any of you knew him. Joe was also quite a wit. And he could put in a single sentence some things that would really, really nail it. You know? My favorite Joe Sobranism is when he said one time, when most politicians wrestle with their conscience, they win. <laughs> I want to see that on his gravestone. I, that, to me, is classic, right? All right now, here's William Bartley. He's the one that uh, asked Chris Dahl to come and write columns for the Wall Street Journal. And in 2001, he wrote a column himself and he said, Mexican President Vicente Fox suggests that NAFTA should evolve into something like the European Union with open borders. He can rest assured that there is one voice north of the Rio Grande that supports his vision to wit this newspaper. The Wall Street Journal is in favor of open borders when Bartley was running it. Now, the Wall Street Journal will occasionally have a decent article and you'll say to yourself, oh, I like that, right? Even National Review. Uh, will occasionally say something and you could agree with it if you still read it. Most people don't anymore, right? But when, you, when you're doing that, I want you to realize that there's poison in there, right? And it will lead you astray. I'll never forget the guy one time who said to me, he said, he said, people tell me that, that this fellow is 95% good. I said, oh, he said, when you think of that, he said, think of, think of rattlesnake poison. Rattlesnake poison, he said, is 95% protein. So if you get bit by a rattlesnake, think of the protein. <laughs> Isn't that what's happening with a lot of these people? Right? Yeah. I have another friend who said uh, his congressman rates 70% on the uh, uh, fellow told him. His congressman rates 70% on our freedom index that we publish in the New American Magazine periodically. He says, now that's pretty good, isn't it? We say, well, didn't the guy take an oath to the Constitution of the United States, a solemn oath? Yeah, he said he did. He said, you know, when I got married, I took an oath to be uh, fidelity to my wife. He said, if I came home some night and say, dear, I'm 70% in, in league with that, uh, how long do you think I'd be married? You know? <laughs> that's the way we should talk about these congressmen and these senators, right? We don't want 70%. Neoconservatives love war. And so we decided to take a look at what is a just war. And a just war is defensive and defensive alone. And it must be formally declared by the proper authority. When's the last time we did that? December 1941. Right? There should be a just cause and the right intention. The last resort, after all else has failed, all the diplomatic the maneuverings and everything else, and you're going nowhere, then you have to defend yourself. Limited and unchanging objectives. How many times have they changed the objective? First in Iraq, they changed it over and over. And then now they're doing it in uh, Afghanistan. Right? Proportionate means no unlimited war. And non-combatants must have immunity. 
Now, you can make a case that World War II started after the Japanese attacked us at Pearl Harbor. You can make a case for us defending ourselves, and that was just. But then look what happened after that. How many of you realize that the Japanese tried to surrender in January of 1945? They gave a full surrender proposal to uh, Douglas MacArthur. He sent it on to Roosevelt, who put it in the bottom drawer, went off to Yalta, and sold out Eastern Europe and some of Asia. Right? And after the, the uh, surrender proposal had not been accepted, then came Iwo Jima. Then came Okinawa. Then came the firebombing of the Japanese cities. And then came dropping A-bombs on two civilian populations. And then the Japanese were permitted to surrender. And the terms were exactly what they had offered in January. That has to be one of the greatest crimes in history, perpetrated by our government. Right? Why? Very simple. They wanted to perfect the A-bomb. They wanted to drop it. They wanted to show its power. And they wanted to scare people into accepting world government. And it got a lot of people to do just that, including a lot of senators. Right? Preemptive war is going on now. We, we seize on something. We go after them. Right? It's the type of war that's not defensive. It's an act of aggression. It's the type of war started without being attacked or without certain expectation of being attacked. What about this concept, right? Well, why do they want war? Plato told us way before Christ. He said, when the tyrant has disposed of foreign enemies by conquest or treaty, and there is nothing to fear from them, he is always then stirring up some war or other in order that the people may require a leader, right? Yeah, he, he nailed it. Shakespeare, in one of his plays, had King Henry IV advise his son, Prince Hal, be at thy course to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels. Is that going on today? Yeah. Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton, look what he said. Safety from external danger is the most powerful director of national conduct. The violent destruction of life and property incident to war will compel nations the most attached to liberty to resort for repose and security to institutions which have a tendency to destroy their civil and political rights. To be more safe, they run the risk of being less free. And if that brings to mind the Patriot Act, that's exactly what I was hoping for. The Patriot Act that no member of Congress saw before they voted for it. None of them. Right. War destroys freedom. Here's the project for the new American century. This was formed by Rumsfeld, Cheney, Wolfowitz, and a bunch of others after they left office in the Bush One administration. And the project for the new American century said, Use U.S. power to meet global responsibilities. I looked all through the Constitution. I couldn't find global responsibilities. Right? So they want us to police the world. And then it says strengthen ties with allies. Well, we've already talked about unnecessary entanglements. Ch challenge regimes hostile to our values. See, preemptive wars. Imagine us going to war against somebody so you have to be, adopt the U.S. system, which, of course, is not the U.S. system they want to adopt, the good one. Insist on political and economic freedom abroad. Force others to adopt our ways. No wonder the people of the world are hating us when they used to love us. And then create an international order. This is all project for the new American century. Right? Who were some of those people that signed on to this? Cheney, Rumsfeld, Elliot Abrams, Paul Wolfowitz, Jeb Bush, Midge Dechter, Steve Forbes, Norman Podoritz, William Bennett, Dan Quayle, Frank Gaffney, and a lot of others, right? They're all big signatories of this. Well, Cheney and Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz wanted Papa Bush to go back into Iraq in 1992. But he got defeated in the end of 1992, and so they were out of office. That's when they formed this project for the new American century. Out of office in 1993, they formed it. 
And then the PNAC petitioned President Clinton and Speaker Gingrich to invade Iraq again during the 90s, right? Well, Clinton ended up being busy with some personal problems. <laughs> and Gingrich was also busy doing other things and he didn't want to have anything to do. He had other plans, right? So it didn't happen, but the path to war continued. When George W. Bush, the second of the Bushes, got the nomination, he turned to Cheney and he said, I want you to search the country and find me a running mate. And so Cheney went from coast to coast and from border to border and came up with Cheney. <laughs> right. So Cheney became the vice president, Rumsfeld became secretary of defense, Wolfowitz was given a big job, top post in the George, and they immediately wanted George W. Bush to go back after Iraq before 9-1-1. They took office in January of, of 2001, and 9-1-1 occurred in September. But after 9-1-1, they had their crisis, their excuse for war. You remember this guy, chief of staff for Obama? A crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And boy, they didn't waste it, did they, right? Here's a man who wrote a book about crises and how they're used, a good book. Crisis and Leviathan, 20th century national emergencies, mainly wars, depressions, and labor disturbances, have prompted federal officials to take over previously private rights and activities. Right? I heard somebody talking about NDAA a little while ago. There's an example of that. Right? So have a crisis and then go. So George W. Bush selected neocons Cheney, Wolfowitz, and Rumsfeld, and others as topmost assistants, attained authorization to invade Iraq from the United Nations. I have a copy of the letter John Negroponte signed addressing the Security Council. We're operating in Iraq on authorization supplied by the United Nations resolutions. We started forcing U.S. values on other peoples and other nations, more socialism, and steadily escalating indebtedness has been what we got out of it. Now, the uh, authorization, that, that's interesting. Here's the defender of the Constitution, the honoree at, at CPAC, Donald Rumsfeld. He's not a conservative, he's a neocon. So long ago, even before we got into this, we, we stopped calling ourselves conservatives. The Birch Society now, uh, I would suggest to all of you that you, what are you? You're a constitutionalist, the Constitution. <laughs> The Constitution is defined. Conservatism well, wasn't, right? It was uh, loosely defined by Goldwater and Russell Kirk and so others, but they kept moving to the left, to the left, to the left, and the, the man who did that was William Buckley. Right? Mark Gerson's a neocon, and he wrote this. The neoconservatives have so changed conservatism that what we now identify as conservatism is largely what was once neoconservatism. And in so doing, they have defined the way vast numbers of Americans view their economy, their polity, and their society. You can imagine what I feel when I hear a guy like Mitt Romney describe himself as a conservative, right? right? I always say to, I say to my wife when I see that on the news program, yeah, and I'm a Martian, right? right, right, right. And she said, yeah, me too, right? Uh, Santorum described himself as a conservative, right? Uh, I don't know how they could possibly do that when they had a Ron Paul th at those debates. And then when they asked Ron Paul, they asked them all, give us one word to describe yourself. What was the word that Ron Paul selected? Consistent. <laughs> Consistent. And he could have said consistently constitutionalist, and he would have been correct, right? Sam Francis wrote in Chronicles, the whole concept of conservatism in America is being virtually, virtually devoid of meaning, in large part because conservatives have made the seminal error of allowing dilettantes like Mr. Buckley to define it for them in the first place, right? Well put. And then he wrote for us in the New American Magazine, as the Cold War wound down, exporting democracy and opposing isolationism became the major neocon foreign policy goals reflected in their almost universal support for NAFTA, World Trade Organization, UN peacekeeping missions, right? He's another man that was betrayed by them. Neoconservative publications, commentary. The, ne the public interest, which went out of business in 2005, was replaced by the national interest, same thing. The weekly standard, I have a friend who calls it the weak need standard, right? <laughs> national Review Magazine. 
Foreign Affairs, Wall Street Journal. Now, as I mentioned, you can find some things you like in some of these publications. But remember rattlesnake poison. <laughs> it's only 5% poison. Prominent neoconservatives holding membership in the Council on Foreign Relations. Dick Cheney, Paul Wolfowitz, Charles Krauthammer, Richard Pearl, Elliot Abrams, Midge Decta, Newt Gingrich, Condoleezza Rice, John Bolton, Henry Kissinger, John McCain, Robert Kagan, Rupert Murdoch. I should have put William Buckley in there because he joined the CFR in 1974. And said when he did, he put it in his own magazine, said that he was angry with them because he thought he was going to be welcome to membership 10 years earlier, right? Right, he, like, John McCain. Does John McCain like war? You remember him singing, bomb, bomb, bomb Iran, bomb, bomb, bomb Iran? He actually sang, right? He's leading us to go to Libya. He wants us to go into Syria and so forth. I think of John McCain, I think of him and Robert Dole, two men who, who ran such poor campaigns for president of the United States that if they had run unopposed, they still would have lost. <laughs> <laughs> Now, occasionally you get some help from a place you didn't expect it. His, the Washington Post ran this chart in their, in their pub publication, in their newspaper, right? The neocons and illustrated, an illustrated progression. The, the character on the far left there is Trotsky. They, they told us the truth. Who else have they got in there? Well, they've got Irving Kristol, and they've got his son, William Kristol, and they've got Gene Kirkpatrick, and they even mentioned William Buckley. Right? Now, why are they doing that? Well, because they don't like the neoconservatives. They want to go straight into socialism under socialism. Right? They don't want to disguise it in any way. So there's competition. So they take a shot at their, uh, their fellow traitors, in my view. Who are some of the ones the Washington Post named? Well, Leon Trotsky, Leo Strauss, the professor from Chicago, Chicago University, Kristol, Podoritz, Buckley, Gene Kirkpatrick, William Kristol. Here's William Crystal. He's the son of the Godfather, so what does that make him? The, the Godfather plus one or something? He's considered conservative, wants to expand the war into Iran. I mean, this man is intensely in favor of more war in Iran. He's the editor of the Neocon Weekly Standard, chairman of the now defunct Project for the New American Century. They went out of business. And they started up again under a new name. And Crystal's the head of that, the new foreign policy initiative. Same thing, except that they changed the name of it, right? Spreading confusion. William Crystal, listen, listen to what he said here. Because Obama has turned on his own statements about war in order to promote the Libyan incursion, Obama is now a born-again neocon. <laughs> what, what a world we live in, huh? Neocons wear a conservative label, but they're mostly Republicans, rhinos as some people call them, Republicans in name only. They claim to support the troops. What's the best way to support the troops? Bring them home, bring them home, bring them home. Emphatically support war, consistently back socialistic legislation, want the U.S. to remain entangled in the United Nations and give the U.N. even more power. Now here's a fellow who had a, a little something to say about neoconservatism. It's not, the mark, it's not the philosophy of free markets and a wise foreign policy. Instead, it represents big government welfare at home and a program to spread their version of American values throughout the world. Good for you, Ron. World government. They always want. Neocons are all in favor of world government. Right? They may have minor disagreements among themselves about small issues, but they all favor continued US subservience to the United Nations. What did George Washington have to say about that? The great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have with them as little political connection as possible. Wouldn't you love to hear that today? Yeah. <laughs> John Quincy Adams, our sixth president. America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. Right? And you could add to that Cal uh, Calvin Coolidge. He one time said, I look upon my chief accomplishment minding my own business. Wouldn't it be wonderful to hear a president say that today? Yeah. Yeah. 
Robert Welsh, famous speech that he gave, we took one sentence out of it, what would be wrong with simply minding our own business, right? And I remember at our 50th anniversary celebration when Ron Paul came to be our featured speaker, him clapping when he saw that, when he saw Robert Welsh saying that, right? So we go back, what has happened here? How to control America? Carol Quigley, Bill Clinton's mentor at Georgetown University. The two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. We can blame the neoconservative movement for doing that to a lot of the Republicans. And of course, the Democrats were already there. There's a nice endorsement from Ron. Okay, okay, you Birch Society, what's your plan? How are we gonna win this? What are we gonna do? Well, we say we take our country back through the House of Representatives and we, we don't think you can steal the presidency, but we'd like to be surprised, right? We'd like very much to be surprised. But we say go to Article 1, Section 7 of the Constitution. All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House. The power of the purse is in the House. If the House refuses to initiate a bill to fund foreign aid, education, housing, medicine, you name it, it's over, right? It's over if the Constitution stands and it's still there. All right, so what we need is uh, a resurgence, more people in the House of Representatives. Uh, what's a majority in the House? 218, okay? The Senate and the White House will be fully dealt with later, right? Getting close to winning. In January 2011, that's only what, 12, 13 months ago, 14 months? Members of the House of Representatives voted on a measure calling for a terminating payment of dues to the United Nations. It's always been understood that refusing to pay dues to the world body effectively means withdrawing from the organization. All right? Now this was only January, this is this particular Congress, and it was the first bill, it was H.R. 1, in January of 2011. And I want you all to think to yourself, how many of the 435 in the House of Representatives voted yes for that? And every audience I had, is, somebody says one. Ron Paul, no, 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 it's better than that, all right? Is there any hope, right? Do we have hope? Well, 177 voted yes to effectively get us out of the United Nations. Now, add 23 and uh, 18, you get 41. We need 41 more, and Robert Welsh always said, Withdraw from the United Nations and you have broken the back of the communist conspiracy. And I agree. That would be a death blow to get us out of the United Nations. We're getting closer, we're getting closer, we're getting closer, right? So all of you folks in the Constitution Party, I know you're gonna have to vote for a president, and I will too, and if he's on the ballot in my state, I'm gonna get the Constitution Party's gonna get a vote, as it has in the past. But. But you also will vote for a member of the House of Representatives, right? It's very important, right? Very important that you get a decent member. Now, I live in Massachusetts. Imagine that, right? There are people who say to me all the time, how can you, the president of the John, how can you live in Massachusetts? I say, I like to work behind enemy lines. <laughs> and indeed, and indeed those are enemy lines, right? But the good news from Massachusetts is that because of the last census, we lose one more Congress seat. Yay! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the need is for more constitutionalists in Congress and in the White House. More adherence to the Constitution. More citizen voter understanding. And whose business is it for citizen voter understanding more than the John Birch Society? I don't know anybody. That's what we do, so we need more John Birch Society members. That's my pitch. I'm not gonna go beyond that, and I'm gonna say thank you very much. You've been very kind to me. I love...